Welcome to the Josh Heisman Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Josh Heisman Podcast. And some of you may know this about me, some of you may not know, but I was a baseball player back in my younger days when I had hair and things were going well. Uh, and I don't talk about it that much, but today is an honor for me because I get to have a guy in this studio who has uh, had a very successful career as a baseball player, and that is awesome, but the, the reason why I wanted him to be on this podcast is because he loves the Lord even more, and his name is R.A. Dickey, and he is here today, and I want to say thank you for coming into the studio, and how are you doing? I'm doing good. It's been a good day, and I appreciate you having me. Thank yeah. You. Man, this is a blessing for me. I was just telling you off camera that I remember the first time I ever heard your name. It was probably in 1995, and a roommate of mine who was a huge UT fan we're, you know, we're playing on a baseball team together, and, and he's like, man, we're struggling. And he said, man, we are pitching, man. We need R.A. Dickey on this team. <laughs> we need him to come and pitch. I said, who's R.A. Dickey? I'm a Chicago kid. I had not heard of, of you just yet, but, of course, I would eventually. But uh, anyway, you, you grew up in Nashville, played in high school, your high school ball here, ended mm -hmm. up at UT as a, as a pitcher. And of course, we, we can go down the road of, of the baseball stuff and all those fun things. But uh, could you tell me a little bit about, um, we have a lot of people who may not have a, a knowledge of your, your sports background and the different things. And, and I'm going to get into some of the, the accolades and, and some of the cool oh, things mercy. that, that okay. you did. Uh, but maybe just as an introduction, uh, it tells some people about yourself. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I was born and raised here. Um, I grew up initially in, I'd say, East Nashville, Nolensville Road, Thompson Lane intersection, went to Glencliff Elementary, Wright Junior High, and then got a scholarship to come to Montgomery Bell Academy, started there in seventh grade. And from seventh to twelfth grade was at MBA, mm -hmm. uh, where I was, um, you know, trying to figure out, you know, after high school, I, I ended up... Uh, being drafted out of high school. So I was trying to figure out, do I go to college at UT or do I go play for the Detroit Tigers out of high school? And trying to weigh and measure that, ended up at UT. Uh, and so played my, my amateur career at the University of Tennessee and had a great time there too. So I was born and bred a Nashvilleian and, um, you know, have loved every minute of it. My wife yeah. too, she, she was, uh, you know, she, was, she grew up here and, uh, you know, so we have both sets of family here. We have four kids presently and uh, you know I, all my all the time my all season home would be here mm -hmm. and so I'd play my season and then we would always return here unless I was playing winter ball and trying to earn money or work on work on something in the, in the you know Venezuela or Puerto Rico or wherever I was playing ball yeah so did, did your wife go to the same high school as you or did you so MBA was an all-boys school so she went to the sister school Harpeth Hall I should know that but well, I don't know it's that. okay no <laughs> believe me I wish it wasn't an all-boys school a lot uh -huh. of times when I was growing up but um yeah, it was. It ended up being great, uh, and I met her uh, through her brother, who was a classmate of mine uh, at MBA, and we eventually became friends and started dating my senior year in high school, and eventually got married. Mm -hmm. And so, was UT always something you wanted to do? Was were there other options or places recruiting you? There were other options, you know, but um, I actually really wanted to go to Vanderbilt, to be honest, mm -hmm. and, and was recruited by them. But at the time. You know, they had a policy in place where they could only take a certain amount of kids from one school. And so I just, my academics weren't uh, up to the standard mm -hmm. that some of my peers were that were applying there. I think they got in um, and they said, you know, I don't think that you're going to uh, ac be able to get in because we've already accepted our quota. So I went to UT and, you know, God knew. I mean, that's exactly where I needed to be and was able to really cultivate both my craft as a pitcher and my faith uh, a lot um, in college. Mm -hmm. 
And so you, you spent, were you uh, three or four years at UT? Because I know uh, you were drafted in 96. Correct. Right? So I, I played 94, 95, and 96 and was drafted after my junior year and went to play for the Texas Rangers. Drafted in the first round with the Texas Rangers. Yes, yes. Yeah, and then you had something in your story that happened in that year that is, it, uh, it's pretty widely known in the sports world now. Yeah. Uh, but for those who aren't listening, it's such an incredible story of adversity where you're drafted in the first round mm -hmm. and... Uh, and then you're on the cover of this magazine pitching for the Olympic team, or was it the Junior Olympics, or what was yeah, no, it? No, it's the Olympic team in Atlanta. Olympic team in Atlanta. Yeah. yeah, and uh, Dr. Andrews does this, um, what do you call it? a scan, yeah. and then they reveal, it reveals something about your elbow. Yeah. What was that? So, you know, uh, when, when you're drafted in the first round and you agree to uh, a large contract or a large signing bonus, uh, you have to submit yourself to a pretty comprehensive physical and you know I'd never been hurt a day in my life you know mm -hmm. I played quarterback at Montgomery Bell Academy and played for the Olympic team during the summers and UT during the fall I mean yeah the fall and the spring and was never hurt never missed a, a start and so I didn't have anything to hide and so when I went down to Texas to take my physical before um I was to sign my contract, throw out the first pitch, meet Nolan Ryan, like all the things that you dream about doing Amazing. as a kid. I know. Um, they called me in the office, in the general manager's office, and said, we think that there's something wrong with your arm, and we need you to go to um, Dr. Andrews and see what that may be. And so they withdrew their contract and said, until we figure out what's going on, we're going to you know, keep this over here and see what's going on. So the very next day, I, I immediately, I left the stadium. I flew back to Nashville, drove down to Birmingham, Alabama, where Dr. Andrews was, and went through a series of tests as well as um, a, what they call a contrast MRI, which is where they inject dye into your elbow, and mm. they can see with clarity what's going on. If you've got you know, frays in the tissue or, I mean, anything that would show up will show up in a contrast MRI. So I took one of those and, you know, I'm, I went upstairs after it was done and I'll never forget turning the corner. My, my wife, who was my, who is my wife now was my, my girlfriend then. And she came down with me. We're kind of walking through this together. And I turned a corner and I was walking towards Dr. Andrew's little area. And I saw all these like interns and whatnot with open books pointing at my MRI and pointing back down at these books. And I, I thought, uh Oh, and then my wife, Ann, she met me about halfway between, uh, where I'd turned the corner and where Dr. Andrews was. And she was bawling crying. And she said, I, I hope that the Rangers believe in miracles. Hmm. And I thought that can't be good. <laughs> and so when I got there, they let me know that they had discovered that I did not have the UCL ligament in my right elbow, meaning um, the ligament that, that connects your humerus to your radius and ulna right there at the elbow joint. It's called the Tommy John surgery. A lot of guys have Tommy John sure. surgery. That is the surgery to replace that ligament. And I didn't even have it. And so they were super confused. They didn't understand. They had never seen a case like this. So they sent me back down to take another MRI. So I had to take two MRIs, go through that whole thing, only to make the same discovery that you know, I didn't have the existence of an ulnar collateral ligament at all in my right elbow. Now, I thought that was great news because that's something I would never hurt. You never have to replace it. I should get more money. <laughs> uh, but when, <laughs> right. uh, when Dr. Andrews reported that to t Texas, um, they thought they had drafted damaged goods and they, they took the whole offer off the table and said, we don't want to touch you. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, that was pretty hard. And uh, riding back from Birmingham that day, understanding that, you know, I, the chance of me playing baseball, something I dreamt about doing since I was knee high, um, might not ever happen. Did they that ever explain, and you know, since I don't know anything about this, did they ever explain to you, how were you able to pitch and throw and do all those things yeah, all those years? Yeah, you know, Dr. Andrews said, hey man, you shouldn't be able to turn a doorknob without feeling some discomfort. You know, we should see a lot of scarring and things in your elbow mm -hmm. um, because of the absence of that ligament that stabilizes your joint. And they were very, very confused. And of course, that may, meant that it was scary for Texas Rangers who had drafted me because they thought I'd blow out at any second, or maybe some other problem would arise because of the absence of that ligament. And, uh, you know, they, the only way they explained it to me was either I tore it when I was very, very small and my body learned to compensate above and below the condition. 
to, to allow me to do what I did, mm. or I was born without it. But not nobody could tell me with certain. I'm talking about the best doctors that we know of in the, our country. Yeah, uh, could not tell me what with certainty what it what they thought had happened. Yeah, I mean, well, what they know had happened. They they could give me hypotheses about what they thought might happen, but none of them really knew. And so I went home thinking that I would never play again and go back for my senior year at UT and just see what happened and you know get my degree. And the night before. The night before that I was supposed to go back, I was an English major, and I had a 9 a.m. class. And I thought, well, if I miss my first day of class, no big deal. Well, the rule was if you step foot on a college campus and attend a class, you forfeit your ability to go play professionally. To sign that previous to sign contract, that, yeah. And yes. I would have to wait a full calendar year and mm -hmm. go back into the draft, right? and then I could be signed. I remember that. Yeah, so... <laughs> It was about 9 p.m., and the phone rang. I was at my, my girlfriend's house, uh, Ann, and uh, I talked to the general manager, and they said, hey, listen, R.A., uh, we understand that you're probably reeling from this. Here's our offer. We'll give you $75,000 and a chance to come and, and play. Um, I had previously agreed to a $925,000 dollar signing bonus I was the 16th pick I think overall in the country and that was the slot money for that for that pick we'll give you $75,000 and you can come to major league camp and see what you can do mm -hmm. so I, I got down on my knees and just prayed about it and felt confident that this might be my only chance to ever play because I would go back to school with this you know this hanging over me that I was this guy that didn't have a ligament you know he was going to eventually break down so I thought I'm going to bet on myself and um, I went. I went and started my professional career in 1996. Yeah. That's something I was curious about when you say get, getting down on your knees and praying about yeah. it. I was wondering, uh, were you a believer at that point in life? Or, yeah, yeah, no, you know, I was. There's so many things that you're involved in that we're going to get get into yeah, that sure. your faith has driven you yeah. to. But but that story specifically, I was wondering, did you have a support community around you? No, that's a great that's question, such a Josh. Difficult yeah, thing. you know, I I felt really lonely in it. You know, I was mad at God. I mean, all the things that you think you might experience, you know. And I remember someone telling me at that time, like, God can take your anger. It's okay. Like, be, you can grieve this. This mm -hmm. is hard. And I had a, I had a good support staff, and you know, I. I came to know Christ through my wife's family, uh, which was really interesting. And, and kind of a side story to that was um, Ann's brother, was who I knew at, at my high school MBA, invited me to come to Fellowship of Christian Athletes event on campus. I was not a believer when I came from East Nashville to Montgomery Bell Academy. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the other side of the tracks. I grew up in a divorced home and uh, very early in my life and was kind of a latchkey kid and you know, bounced around quite a bit. All that to say is when I got to MBA, I, I had no foundational faith of any kind, really. I'd been to church with my grandmother, but only just to be with her. It wasn't to learn about Christ or anything. Yeah. Didn't, didn't go to youth group, didn't do anything like that. And he, he, I'll never forget him inviting me. He was a year older. He was an eighth grader. I was a seventh grader. We were on the same football team. He came up to me after a football practice. He said, hey, man, do you want to come to FCA? Didn't really know him. He took a risk. You know, I said, FCA, what's that? He said, it's Fellowship of Christian Athletes. What do you do there? I said, well, well people share about their uh, experience with Christ, and we talk about our faith. And I said, oh, well, okay, thanks. That'd be, <laughs> that'd be great, right? Uh -huh. Like, I just wanted to be around people. Yeah. And it was a real lonely experience for me because I didn't know anybody. And this was the first guy that kind of reached out and said, hey, man, you want to you wanna come hang out? And so I said, yeah. And fortunately, where he wanted to hang out was, a, was FCA. And so that's that was my introduction to Christ. Now, it took probably me going back to meeting after meeting after meeting before I really felt like God and listening and observing, watching. And here, here's a, a, you know something that I try to take with me every day of my life, including my life as a father, is there's always somebody watching, mm -hmm. right? Like, and so with Bo, who was Ann's brother, you know, I would watch him. You know, I just wait for him to make a mistake or do something I didn't feel like matched up with his faith. And if he did... I would see him repent of it in the moment, and I'd be like, God, that, like instead of trying to justify it or like explain it away, mm -hmm. he'd say, man, I'm so sorry. I, I should not have done that. I'm sorry about that. Like, and so he would, he, would be, he would have a real repentant heart in the moment, but he, would, you know, he lived in a way that I thought was really neat, and he had this 
peace about him no matter what and just about every circumstance on the football. Like I was a really high-intensity competitor. And so when I went to NBA, that's all I knew. That was my church, right? Mm -hmm. My church was a field or a court, played basketball, football, and baseball at NBA. And when I saw him and the fact that, you know, he would have things happen to him on the football field, he was a great football player, he was a wrestler, state champion, and things would happen and he would just be like even kill, man. And I, I, I longed for that. Mm -hmm. And the source of that for him was Christ and his relationship with him and the fact that how he performed his performance as an athlete was not his real value, that he was a child of the living God and he could live out of that joy. And I never knew what that meant until yeah. watching him do it. And so, I mean, the moral of the story for me was I got to kind of observe that first few months until I felt like, man, this is something I wanted. This God that you're talking about, this Christ that you're talking about, like I want that peace. I long for it. And I had pretty severe trauma in my life leading up to those years. And mm -hmm. so, you know, and I was haunted by that stuff. And so I wanted relief from that. I wasn't sure I wanted a relationship. That's different than relief, right? Mm -hmm. But I didn't mm -hmm. want relief. And that was the beginning for me. And so I got down on my knees at his house with his mom and him and asked Christ into my heart and felt a real change of spirit from that moment on. Now, I didn't really cultivate my faith from there because I didn't have a ton of support. And that would come much later. But to your point and your question, uh, I did have a faith at that time in 1996. You know, mm -hmm. I, was, I was a young believer, but at the same time, I really wanted to depend on God's plan for my life. And so I had that as, as something that galvanized me a little bit, but still had hard questions and, you know, wrestled with God about things really intimately. And uh, I did have her family coming alongside me and really helping me make good decisions in those moments. Yeah. Uh, it, you used a, a, a term in there. I don't know if the Rangers actually told you this or if this is just what you heard. Uh, you said damaged goods. Yeah. For an athlete, especially someone who was excelling at a top level, and you're a first-round draft pick. I mean, that that, that is rare error. And then to hear a term, damaged goods, did that mess with your mind at all as an athlete going then because you signed that contract yeah, and then yeah. you go into to your pro ball pro ball days, you want to be walking to the mound with complete confidence sure. or whatever. No, and absolutely. That that did that mess with your mind at all? You know, and that's a good question. I, I they never said that to me, but I read that. It was in magazines and it oh, was okay. in articles and you know, it was a pretty big story nationwide when it went down because nobody had really ever seen it or heard about it. And they had followed my collegiate career and knew that I was probably going to be a high pick. So when something like that occurred, you know, it made – back then we didn't have social media, you know, so you're reading papers and stuff. But, you know, articles would say that quite a bit, that the Rangers drafted damaged goods. And I always mm -hmm. remembered that. And, you know, just to give you a little bit of backstory and it will give you some context as we talk, you know, that – I learned, you know, in my 30s that that experience really, uh, it was really hard to hold because um, I already felt that way because of trauma I had experienced as a eight and nine year old boy. I went through some pretty severe sexual trauma when I was young, mm -hmm. sexually abused, and um, you know, I've since done a lot of work around that, which is one of the reasons that I have a heart for the things I do. But at the same time, it was a reminder that, that that's who I was, that I was damaged goods and I was yeah. ugly. And because that's what you feel like when you're eight and nine, you don't really have a, you know, you don't have a place to put that kind of trauma. Um, and unless you're in, a, in an incredible supportive group with people who have done work and therapy and like you're not, you're going to start to develop mechanisms to protect yourself and I, that's what I was doing you know mm -hmm. my growth in essence was stunted at eight and nine years old so when I saw damaged goods on the paper in reference to my, athle my athletic achievements or what I was hoping to accomplish it was a trigger for me in a lot of different ways because I already felt that way and was trying to hide that from the world mm -hmm. and so it was really, really, really difficult. Those, yeah. those years were really hard. And mindset is such an interesting thing because the reason why that question came to mind for me is because, you know, what I what I had heard of you in from a distance, I hadn't seen you pitch in person, 
but the only thing that changed was that uh, uh, an MRI or whatever that scan yeah, was. Exactly. You were still the same picture and still. Uh, but uh, what did you struggle immediately going into pro ball, or did things go well your first couple of years in minor league ball? No, it was it was a real. I mean, I was battling a lot of demons in there. I mean, it was really hard. Mm -hmm. uh, I think because I felt like it was a me against the world kind of thing. Felt very lonely mm -hmm. in that that I didn't. Like this was a team that really didn't want me to begin with, and I felt like they felt sorry for me, so they were going to give me a shot, you know. Mm -hmm. um, most first-rounders get the benefit of the doubt on just about everything, you know, and get a real opportunity time after time. And I didn't feel that way. I felt like I was going to have to prove and reprove and reprove and reprove myself, and that was a hard burden to bear. Um, had a little bit of a breakdown uh, physically, not, not mentally, but physically, uh, my first year and so I repeated a ball in 1998 and um, did really really well and started moving up the ladder that way but you know it was hard those first couple of years were hard because of that it's a good insight sure. mm -hmm. and so how many years did you spend uh, I, I let me just kind of give this yeah. away for our uh, sure. the audience here who may not know this because so, you RA becomes known I'm gonna say this to the camera uh, he reaches the the height of what you can reach as a baseball player, a pitcher in Major League Baseball. In 2012, he's going to win the Cy Young Award. He's going to be on the All-Star team uh, with the New York Mets. I mean, these amazing accomplishments of which come about when you completely change the way you pitch. Right. And you, you go from what we will call a traditional pitcher sure. to a knuckleball pitcher. And you made that change. What year did you make that change? So, yeah, so the first 10 years of my career, I was a conventional guy. Mm -hmm. I, would, I got drafted because I was a hard thrower. I threw mid-90s, and that was hard for back then. Um, nowadays, that's, that's on the low end a lot of times. You've got guys that are throwing 100, 100 It's insane. Miles. It's insane how many people are throwing so hard these days. But all that to say is I was drafted as a hard thrower and a conventional pitcher and was a conventional pitcher for the first 10 years of my career. Only three of those 10 did I spend in the major leagues. So f seven years were in the minor leagues trying to get there, trying to figure it out, trying to develop a secondary pitch, all the things that you had to do to cultivate your craft to get there and earn the respect and trust of major league managers and front office people and all that. But I was a conventional pitcher, and as that 10, you know, and that was the last three years of those 10. So the first six I spent grinding it out. Mm -hmm. Well, every year I'd kind of come back to spring training, and I'd, I felt like I was losing a mile an hour or two. I couldn't figure out why. I wasn't hurt. And I threw so much in college and, and with the Olympic team, you know, your arm only has a certain amount of pitches at a certain velocity. Mm -hmm. And then it just starts to get like a rubber band that's been stretched out over time, right? I mean, you just can't get the elasticity that you need to generate the arm speeds to produce the velocity. And so that, that velocity, which was a weapon for me for so long, was starting to deteriorate. And as it deteriorated, I still had the passion and hope to play in the major leagues, but I didn't really have the weaponry anymore. <laughs> and so uh -huh. um, in 2005, I was a member of the Texas Rangers in the bullpen. Buck Showalter was my manager, and Oral Hershiser was my pitching coach. And I was getting roughed up pretty good, and they could see that my fastball was topping out at about 89, 90, when it was once 95, 96. And that just wasn't good enough at that time to get big league hitters out. They knew that. I could kind of see the writing on the wall. They called me in the office and they said, hey, we, uh, we're, we're telling you that what you have presently isn't good enough anymore. And you can hear from us that you're not good enough anymore. Or you could take what we're about to ask you to do and know that we believe in who you are and what you might accomplish. And it was then that they asked me to desert being a full-time conventional pitcher and step into being a full-time knuckleball pitcher. And that was in 2005. So I spent 10 years as a conventional pitcher. And then in 05, Buck and Oral said, hey, man, we, we think you could be a good knuckleball pitcher. Mm -hmm. And we're willing to give you some latitude to be able to fail and pick yourself back up and learn it. And mm -hmm. we'll send you down the minor leagues and see if you can't figure it out. And if you do, we'll call you back up and see what it can do for us. That's, that's so awesome because what my mind goes to, you know, we all grow up playing baseball and, you know, before games, we're all lined up down the 
first base or third base line, depending on whatever it is. And everybody wants to throw their knuckleball, oh, yeah, right? Sure. And uh, I could never <laughs> throw one, man. I, I, it was it was a joke. And so here you are, a pitcher. So you you they didn't just say that. You must have been able to throw something pretty nasty. Well, they saw me throw it. I threw it in a couple of games, you know, and I would call it my changeup. But they saw it. <laughs> okay. Right? Like I said, and it was a changeup. It was a lot slower than my uh -huh. fastball. But... And just for those of you out there that don't know what a knuckleball is, is every pitch that you see on TV is meant to impart a certain type of spin on the baseball. Well, a knuckleball is antithetical to that. What you try to do when you throw a knuckleball is you're trying to reduce the spin to about a quarter of a revolution from the time it leaves your hand to the time it gets to the catcher's mitt. A quarter of a revolution, trying to feel that every mm -hmm. time. And that's hard to do. And so I had to unlearn the mechanic that I had as a conventional pitcher in order to really embrace a mechanic that I could repeat as a knuckleballer. So they saw me do that on the side with down the third baseline, first baseline. I'd be playing catch with my partner. We'd be throwing knuckleback, knuckleballs back and forth. Yeah. I'd, be, I'd be hitting them in the knee. He'd be whiffing them. Yeah. And they're like, what's that? What's that? I'd say, oh, it's just a knuckleball I'm playing yeah. around with. Well, A, a good knuckleball, for, like even try, like for someone like me who would try to catch a knuckleball that yeah. somebody would throw... People might not understand this. It it almost looks like it defies physics. Sure. When that ball is coming at you, even as a hitter, I remember if, if a pitcher threw a good knuckleball and you, even if you knew it was coming, I mean, it, it would almost put you into a trance. It would. That's a good, and a lot, of hitter, a lot of hitters will describe it like that, like it puts them in a trance. And, um, you know, if you don't, like you can easily Google knuckleball or YouTube knuckleball and it'll show you kind of what it does. But you know, the, the art of throwing a knuckleball is the art of subtracting spin from the baseball first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And then it's, you know, how consistently can you do that from the slope of a mound? Mm -hmm. And then it's how many times can you repeat that in the strike zone, right? And so your knuckleball has to be good enough where a big league hitter who's trained to hit balls 700 feet is swings and misses at it or mishits yeah. it. It's got to be good enough for that. And then you got to find a... Uh, you know, you've got to try to tame a ball that's moving three or four different directions into the strike zone. And so I could throw a good knuckleball on the side. A lot of people can. But when you get on the mound in a competitive situation against Vladimir Guerrero or Albert Pujols or somebody that you're trying to get out, it's a whole different ball game. And so they thought I had what it took to get to that point, And they were going to give me the room to go down there and work on that. And so that's what I did in 2005 after 10 years of being a commissional pitcher. Mm -hmm. And so when you began doing that and you, you go in, it wasn't success right away, no. right? Or how long did it take you to kind of hone that craft? Well, I'll just tell you, my first my first minor league outing with the knuckleball, I gave up 10 earned runs, 10. Mm -hmm. And five, in, five, five innings at the AAA level against the Iowa Cubs. I'll never forget it. And, <laughs> you know, guys were running the bases all over me because you can't really control it and you're slow to the plate and the ball's coming out slower. Knuckleball's throwing much slower than a fastball. And so, you know, it took some real time to just be competitive with it, much less be good at it. Mm -hmm. And outing after outing, I'd get a little better and a little better and a little better. And I was the, – the hardest thing is – that you know you you don't have anybody that can coach it right it's not like everybody has thrown an uncle ball at the big league level mm -hmm. a pitching coach is a good pitching coach because he's got experience throwing a fastball slider curveball change up but nobody really throws a knuckleball, ball and there's only a certain few that are able to do that now fortunately for me in between 2005 and 2006 i was able to hook up with charlie huff who was oh a, yeah who was a great okay. knuckleballer i was a white Sox fan yeah so up. you he know pitched, him. yeah so Charlie Huff was one of the only knuckleballers in the big leagues. I mean, there really were only a few. It was Tim Wakefield, Charlie Huff, Phil Necro from way back, Tim Candiotti. There might have been a couple others in there, but not many could ever do it. Mm -hmm. And so I flew out to California and I worked with him. I think the moral of the story is, you know, like it's so helpful to be with people that are like-minded and can pour into you and are selfless with their gifts. And like that's what... You know, I think back on Buck Showalter and Oral Hershiser, them seeing in me what I couldn't see in myself at a time when I really needed it changed the course of my life, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Bo Bartholomew asking me to come to FCA, taking a risk, um, having empathy, and saying, come to FCA, changed the course of my life. Like, you, I have all these moments in my life where, you know, 
as much as I've accomplished in baseball, there's none among us that are a self-made man or woman. I mean, we're all the product of people who have loved us well, right? Yeah. Uh, on and off the field. And thankfully, in 06, I was with Charlie Huff, who loved me well and started showing me some tricks with the knuckleball, and I got a little bit better. Then I met with Tim Wakefield. Then I met with Phil Necro. And so those were Tim, Tim Wakefield and Phil Necro and Charlie Huff were kind of the Jedi counsel for me of knuckleballers. Yeah. Like, they were always on my speed dial. I was always calling them, sending them film getting feedback from them and slowly but surely was starting to be able to implement the things that they were trying to teach me. Um, and that's kind of how I improved. Yeah. You're making my mind go. There's so many powerful things I think you're sharing that one thought that I went to, I was thinking of Oral Hershiser and then your head coach was uh, your manager. Sorry, head yeah. coach. I got football in the brain. Um, Buck Showalter. Uh-huh. So you said, uh, how, I think that's a good leadership lesson in that they didn't come at you with, I mean, they could have just dropped the hammer on you and, sure. and you know, it's, it's a business. Mm-hmm. This is the way this works and whatever, but to actually have the, the mindset to say to you, uh, you're going to hear that we don't believe in you, but actually we yeah. actually, there's a change. And I, I just, I love that approach that they had with that. Wasn't that good? Yeah. And then I think that's a good lesson for any of us who sure. manages people. And then also you were in a place where just you sharing a little bit of your story, what did that mean to you that they weren't just giving up on you? I mean, that they weren't, that they were saying, hey, maybe here's another avenue. Yeah, I think it was motivating. Encouraging and motivating, I think, were the two uh, descriptors I would use. I, you know, and especially I was at a time where I was getting beat up pretty good at the big league level. So, you know, as a major league pitcher, I was mediocre as a conventional guy by my own admission. I mean, I just... I didn't have the command as like a Greg Maddox or somebody like that. I was a stuff guy. So I was going to beat you because I had better stuff than you. And so when that stuff started to go away, I I didn't have the other things that you would need to possess to be a good major league pitcher. And I could kind of see that. But my ego still wanted to hang on Mm -hmm. to, hey, man, you've only played for one team. There's 29 other teams. Right, right. right. they, They might believe in you. And so there was a real lesson for me in laying down my ego. Because if I would have held on to that, I would have said, no, forget you, man. Like, I think I can do it. I'm going to go somewhere else and prove you wrong. Um, thankfully, I think that was another God moment for me. Like, he just said, you know, he let loud all those those defenses and the, the ego that comes with, you know, male bravado to be laid down. And I, what I heard from them was very encouraging. It was motivating. It's like, it's like I see you, you know, mm-hmm. like that whole bit about, you know, they just saw the humanity of the situation. That doesn't always happen in professional sports because, like you said, you know, your pawn's on a chessboard. I mean, organizations are paid to win, mm-hmm. and championships in particular. And so if you're not helping them win or you can't be a part of that chessboard in some way, you're, you're gone. Yeah. That's just the way it is. And so for them to see the humanity of a, of a moment um, was r- super encouraging. Now, I don't know if I saw it in that moment as clearly as I did in retrospect. You rarely do, right? right? But... At, at the same time, I think it was a supernatural occurrence that I really embraced it, right? Like I, I heard something in it that was so appealing yeah, yeah. that I wanted to chase it. And that doesn't always occur. That was a supernatural kind of God-ordained, mm-hmm. you know, I'm going to live out of the spirit that I put in you when you accepted me as Lord and Savior, and I'm going to allow you to set that down in this moment, even though you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Like that was that kind of thing. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Let me just say one more thing about your, your career in baseball, because it needs to be said, and you're not going to say it about yourself, so I'm going to say it. Um, in that 2012 year when you won the Cy Young, and your record was 20-6, and six, you set the Mets record for, for most consecutive scoreless innings, 32 and, and two-thirds innings with no runs allowed. Okay, so... Uh, that's nuts. <laughs> like, like, did you? I did love that. Were, part, were you true. like, I mean, you know, as I was a hitter, I was never a pitcher, but there were moments when you would just get in the zone. And, and did you feel like every knuckle, every ball you threw was just I mean, gold? How did that feel? You know, I, I think it was just the whole year to, for, for, to win a Cy Young Award. So many things have to fall into place. For instance, your defense has to play great. We weren't a great team. We were a sub-500 team. Mm. So to win 20 games on a sub-500 team, you just have to hit the right day mm-hmm. when the offense isn't asleep, right? And so, like, we scored runs, and the the marginal calls that could have been balls by the umpire were called strikes, and we'd throw a runner out with sec- at second. Like, those kinds of things, yeah. I was aware that those things were happening. 
But I will say, like, I, I never had more confidence. Um, when I took the mound, every time, I felt like I was going to throw a no-hitter. Mm-hmm. I mean, and I just, I never, I might have come out of that four or five outings out of 33. I had 33 starts that year. About four or five out, outings out of those 33, I was like, okay, I got to figure this out because I don't have a great knuckleball. And the other 27 were like, I think I'm going to throw a no-hitter. Mm-hmm. I think I'm going to throw a no-hitter. Could you tell in the bullpen before the game if how it was going? Um, or was that sometimes? Never? No, that's kind of you know a lot of times too because the way a knuckleball works is like climate and and conditions matter. Mm. So if I'm warming up this way, but the mound on the field is that way, and I'm getting wind in my face down here, but I'm not down there, that impacts the movement of the baseball. Mm. So I may have a unbelievable knuckleball and a bullpen that warms up in the direction opposite of what I'm going to have to experience on the field. Okay, and so I don't ever put a lot of you know, shelf like stock in that. But at the same time, I do know how it, it's coming out of my hand. And if it's coming out of my hand right, chances are I'm going to, I'm going to figure it out. And that's what was happening. Like I just, I had put in so many hours of work and, and getting beat up, right? Like, mm-hmm. and failing. I think that's part of the moral of the story, I think is, you know, I also, in the, I am the major league leader in the history of baseball of most home runs given up in a singular game. <laughs> okay. Right? How many is that? that? That was six home runs in three and two thirds innings. Oh man. And I tied a modern day major league record as a knuckleballer. That was my very first start in the major leagues as a knuckleball pitcher. And so I own that record. I also own the record for most wild pitches in an inning in the history of the game, 150 year old game. I'm number one at two really negative, negative uh, mm. categories. So the moral of the story is, you know, there, like adversity is is part of it. Like, like embracing some of that is part of what allowed me to get to the moment in 2012 where I felt like I could throw a no hitter every time. Yeah. Right. Um, and that you know it also helped that I, I I had really done a lot of work mentally on with with a sports psychologist or a therapist here in Nashville. You know, unpacking some of my past where I felt a lot more freedom pitching than I ever had before in those later years. The best parts of my the best part of my career was age 35 to 43, right? Like mm-hmm. that's not normal. That's not normal at all, right? Right. Um, and so that was the product of really doing a lot of hard work both on my craft, yes, physically with the pitch, but I really attribute most of that to just this this amalgamation of people pouring into me spiritually and me uh, like learning things about that and also just how to how to treat the game from a mental s- standpoint. Mhm. Um you want to hear a funny pitching story? Yeah. So Always. when I was in high school, this is my only pitching story. As I told you, I was a third baseman in high school, so I had a good arm yeah. and could throw. Uh, the the starting pitcher on my high school team was Mark Molder. Oh yeah, who pitched for Oakland A's, yeah, St. Louis Cardinals, them, played and, yeah. with them, all of it. He's still still a good He's friend, great. and and so so he was our number one. So we didn't we we didn't need to worry about me stepping in, but I couldn't pitch. But I was a third baseman, and our high school coach in uh, one of our summer league games going into our, our final year, senior year, he said, Josh, you throw pretty hard. Let's, let's put you in there and see, see what you can do. Sure. And I said, coach, I don't, I don't, I don't know about that. And uh, he goes, what's the worst that could happen? Home run. I was like, are you good point? So, <clears throat> so I go out first, first batter of the game, first pitch, the dude rips one. I'm talking about a <laughs> missile that, that hits the top of the fence and breaks the little plastic thing oh, yeah, that goes the around the top pipe, of the fence, yeah, yeah. corrugated pipe, and falls in the ground. The dude hits a triple. <laughs> Coach, timeout, walks out to the mound, give me the ball. <laughs> Go to third base. He, and he goes, he goes, that was about as close as the worst thing that could happen. <laughs> That's crazy. And I was like, okay. I'll, I'll go I love with it that. that he gave you only one pitch. One pitch. So it was it was good. But uh, anyway, all right. So let's let's jump back into uh, your faith a little bit. How sure. how difficult was it to uh, live out your faith as a as a pitcher, going through maybe all that adversity. That's that's hard. You're having all the things of this world thrown at you in in that level. Yeah. Well, you know, it depends. I, I think I can answer that most honestly by telling you that you know I probably handled it differently in different seasons of my life. 
mm-hmm. right? I think early on, I had much more of a quiet faith. And that's just because I was intimidated and didn't know scripture, the scripture as well. Right. Right. So I wasn't prepared. Right. So, you know, I'd get into a situation and I know that I had read something once that said this or that, couldn't remember it. So I'd, I felt a little bit intimidated. And that was probably early in my career. But like that, that nuclear faith, that faith that, that, you know, comes out of the, your gut and the, and the depth of your heart, that was always there. So I always connected with God on a real intimate level. I just didn't know how to articulate my faith. And I knew enough about my faith to try to stay away from, you know, things publicly that would damage it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, come later in my life, I started to really be honest about my shortcomings with God and my teammates. And I felt like that was a real neat way to connect with them in an effort to, you know, try to win them over to the Lord. I mean, mm-hmm. that was my hope ultimately. And so I think, you know, for me, and there were, there are a lot of temptations there and look, I, you know, whether it's the temptation to not work hard. I mean, there's a lot of, you, you can quantify it as a human being, however you like, but whether it's wa- looking at pornography or not working hard or like to quantify sin for us, if we understand that sin is separation from God, right? Like, and mm-hmm. then that puts it in a whole different light for me. Degrees of sin, yes, there are certain consequences that comes with certain degrees of sin. Absolutely, have been since the beginning of time. Um, but just the, the understanding that, you know, God hates a white lot of my wife, just like He does I me mean, looking at a pornog- pornographic magazine. Yeah. Like, right? Like, understanding that part helped really kind of, you know, motivate me to try to do it different. Um, mm-hmm. And so um, as I went forward and got older and started doing more work and surrounding myself with people who had similar faiths and really risking relationship, I was finally at a place in my life through a lot of work where I could trust another man in particular because my sexual abuse occurred with a, with a, a, man, a, a man and a babysitter. And so mm. I... I I had to work through a lot of that before I really had the ability and the equipment to trust somebody deeply. And so when I got to that point, I was just like, God overwhelmed me with love and relationship. Mm-hmm. And I've always been so grateful for that. And that's been, truthfully, that's been motivation for me to really, you know, kind of pay it forward in a lot of ways. You know, I feel like God has given me a really hard story, but a really incredible story. And out of that story, You know, there are things that I can communicate that I think would be very, very helpful for people. And so that was why I wrote my book and that was why, you know, I speak around the country. And it's because that's why is because I feel like God's given me a narrative to share. Yeah. Um, But it took a lot of work to get to that point. You know, the reason I can talk about my abuse now and I can tell you, you know, I kept it a secret from age eight to age 31. And so I lived with that my whole life, not even told my wife. So I had to like be very vulnerable about, you know, my story with my wife and with the understanding that I had lied to her and the man that she was marrying, she didn't really know. And I had to be willing for her to walk out of that because I did that deceitfully. Mm. And when she didn't and said, hey, you know, I'm here with you. I can see you. You mean right, you, when you heart. when you say that you mean as far as walking, knowing that that no one else knew what had happened to you when you were young and you were carrying those yeah, things with so, you? Yeah, so so I, I from age eight to age thirty one, no one ever knew that I had been abused. Mm-hmm. You know, for a full calendar year. So from my eight years old to nine years old, and I was so petrified at that point of telling anyone because one. You always feel, and any any survivor of sexual abuse will tell you this, you feel like you played a part, mm-hmm. no matter how egregious it was, you know, or how violent it was, or how much you felt like you had no say. Yeah. There's a part of it that you feel like, oh God, I've done something wrong, and I'm I'm hideous for it. And so you don't want to sh- you don't want anybody to know that. Yeah. Right. Especially as an eight, nine year old kid. So I spent from eight to thirty one polishing my equipment to be able to manipulate people and keep them at arm's length and present like a chameleon a certain way so you would really like me. But all the while behind the backdrop, I had all kinds of turmoil going on and had deep, dark questions about all kinds of things and would never let you really get to know me and 
you know, I could steer people certain ways just to take advantage of them. Like I had sharpened my quiver uh, with all kinds of toxic tools. And it wasn't until I got to the end of myself and, you know, had made a mess of my marriage and my career was falling apart. And God said, hey, man, like, this is not it. Mm -hmm. This is not it. And I was bawling, crying in a vacant home that I had. My wife had moved out to another house at the time. And I was just, you know, undone. And the pastor of my church showed up the next day. Mm -hmm. And we started walking together and talking together. And, you know, he knew my heartache. And then I start, he, he said, hey, man, why don't, why don't you get with a counselor? And so I was introduced to a, a guy here locally. Uh, his name is Stephen James, and he really helped transform my life in a lot of different ways by, you know, going deep with me. And about three sessions in, he said, man, I know you're not telling me the whole story. I was trying to do the same thing I'd always done to everybody else to him. You didn't know anything else? I didn't know anything else. And he had a gift. Uh -huh. Like, he could, he penetrated, you know, he knew. Yeah. And so, and he had done the training around all that work, and... You know, um, my pastor didn't know. I just, he knew something was wrong. He just didn't know what. He thought it was my career falling apart, me dealing with that. But all the while, it was just being captive to what had gone Can on in you, my past. Would you tell me, where are we in the timeline of your career in that? Yeah, so right when I was becoming a knuckleballer. Okay. It's almost the same time, which is so God. Hmm. Right, like leaving the, who you were behind and embracing something new, <laughs> taking you forward, man. I mm. mean, it's the most poetic story that I, like you can't pick it off the shelf of a Barnes and Noble and read one more beautiful. I mm -hmm. mean, it's it's a real neat, and, and for him to give me eyes to see that has been one of the most incredible privileges of my life. But yeah. anyway, at, at the time I was trying to figure out my knuckleball, you know, I was scuffling with it, trying to figure out, you know, am I even gonna get to be a major league baseball player anymore? Right. Um, my career was kind of falling apart. I had just given up all those home runs. Right. Got sent down to the minor leagues. And that's the that's the timeline. I was 05, 06, right in that area mm -hmm. as I was starting to embrace the knuckleball and try to push forward into that season of my life. When I got with my counselor and started unpacking all of this stuff, he saw he saw me three sessions in. He said, man, I know you're not telling the truth about who you are and what has happened to you. And I said, what do you mean? And I'd give him all these sports center answers because I was good at that. Yeah, right? like yeah. I, could, I could pretend. And he just would never buy it. And I didn't tell him mm -hmm. that session, didn't tell him the next session, until finally he said, we're not going to ever get anywhere, and neither are you. You're never going to be able to live in freedom or pitch with freedom until you come, come clean with what's going on in your life. And so I just I felt the Holy Spirit overwhelmingly say, man, take a risk. And so I did, and that was the beginning of the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. And, and I was just in the math. You said from eight years old to thirty-one years for twenty-three years of your life, mm -hmm. twenty-four. Or tw you know, well, I'm not good at math. Yeah, tw twenty-three. <laughs> you're, Let's you're, call it twenty-three. You're Felt you're like carrying 50. this weight on your shoulders that God never meant for you to carry. You know, and I know it. and uh, so like it just man. It's it's a it's a powerful story and and I think is a good segue into um, what you're doing now and one of the reasons I asked you to come on here uh, at least it is for me and maybe you have a different story to it but the hat you're wearing right now not yeah. N A H T the yeah. Nashville Anti Human Trafficking Coalition mm -hmm. that uh, Mary Trapnell who's been on this podcast and and did a great job uh, when she was in here and then we also had a special event where she shared and yeah. The work that that she's doing and the organization's doing, and and uh, she was saying, well, you know, RA is on the, uh, and you're the only RA I've ever heard, by the way. <laughs> I, I might be the only one out there. Right? Yeah. So she goes, RA helps on the board. I said, wait, who, who, like the pitcher, RA Dickey. She goes, yeah, he's on the, he's on, he's a uh, vice chair of the board, and I was like, oh, <laughs> that's awesome. So how did you get connected to her? You know, um, well, when I was playing. After the 2010 season, I'd made it up with the Mets and started to kind of flourish as a knuckleballer. And, you know, I, I felt like God was giving me a real neat platform in New York to um, just make a difference out of my own wounds. I'd started to I had started to really kind of see the redemptive light of my own story and just I couldn't help but want to share with other people who might have walked in similar 
in a similar space. Mm -hmm. And so I got involved with an organization called the Bombay Teen Challenge. And Bombay Teen Challenge is, is an organization out of India that deals in international human trafficking. And so I went and to raise money for that organization. I went to the top of Kilimanjaro and we raised a quarter of a million dollars. I got to the P, came back down, and we took that money and we built a clinic in the middle of the red light district in Kamathapura, India, where um, prostitutes who had been trafficked in could use, they all had HIV, I mean, all of them, it was just horrible. Mm -hmm. I, I went over there to India and, and worked with these guys, and that was my introduction into the human trafficking space, and I knew then that I just, I wanted to try to, you know, pour into that, to that. And so for the, the, the next years, all the way up until 2017, when I was a member of the Atlanta Braves, and that was my last year to play, um, I, I quit playing baseball after 2017. I felt God saying to me at that point, hey, man, there's, there's stuff going on in your own backyard, and I want you to get involved. And I was like, in my spirit, I was like, well, there's nothing like that out of here here. You know, this is an uh -huh. international deal. You know, it's like the movie Taken, right? Like, right. you know, all those international movies about trafficking. And he said, no, there's like, you need to be involved in your community. And I said, Lord, I'm willing, but I just, I'm going to wait on you for that. And I, I kid you not, two days later, Mary Trapp now came to my front door <laughs> with Nashville Anti-Human Trafficking Coalition. And that's, that's God, man. It is. So he hit me with the right hook and I jumped on board immediately um, within a day. And it was a fledgling organization at the time. They had done a lot of great work, but but we uh, we had a lot of more great work to do. And so I joined the board then, and that was about four years ago. But the reason is because I feel a real connection with people who have experienced sexual wounds. Like I've done my own work around it, continue to do my own work around it, and the freedom that you get from unburdening yourself. Um, through a relationship with the living God. Because if you turn from something so dark like trafficking or abuse or any addiction, I mean, you better be turning to something that's so full of light and hope that it, it changes the course of all of what you once knew, mm -hmm. right? You can't just turn from that to, you know, rehab. Like the chances of you reverting are about 85%. Um, and so we wanted to offer a different way to do it at NAHT. And, you know, we've rescued over 140 women from the Nashville area in this zip code right here in our backyard, Williamson County, Davidson County, Bell Mead, Brentwood, you know, all around. So it's not just a, a Murfreesboro Road, Dickerson Road, right. you know, trap house above the pool hall kind of thing. It's happening in our community all around us. And I can tell you that, um, with that, with the advent of social media and the way that traffickers, you know, uh, are working to capture our young people online mm -hmm. and look for vulnerabilities that they can exploit. Um, traffickers pay people to just monitor these social media sites so that they can pick up on conversations. And then all of a sudden they'll DM somebody on the back door before you know it, they've established a relationship and they're, they're in. Yeah, And so that's happening. And so we're developing programming at NAHT called Educate to Recognize, which is going into the school systems and talking to our most vulnerable demographic, which is 7 to 12-year-old kids, and trying to catch it before it ever gets to the point where we have to make the rescue. That's, like, that's the blessing, you know. Yeah, all that stuff, addiction, trafficking, it's just looking for a door, Yeah, a one-time door. It, it doesn't all happen at once. It's, it's just leaving. The, if you leave that door yeah. open, uh, in, in, in this day and age, so easily kids are so susceptible to it. Oh, and, man, and because just, everybody's looking, you know, if you don't have, and even, even people that do have a knowledge of who Christ is but haven't experienced his intimacy, mm -hmm. there's, you know, it's still hard. For, for them. It's hard for me, and I have a real deep faith, right? Like, I'm still challenged daily. And so these traffickers, they groom our kids, right? Like, they, they will pursue them for years, mm -hmm. like from 8th to 11th. And just, you know, I'll give you a quick story. It won't take very long. But there was a, a girl in our community who was divorced, um, divorced family, 
you know, friends were wealthy and she wanted some of the things that the friends had. She didn't have the money to do it. Somebody and, and that, that conversation with her friends online was monitored by a trafficker. She gets a DM message on the back door saying, hey, we'll give you $100 if you'll just send us a picture of your feet. Mm -hmm. So she said, sure, I'll do that. Fast forward a year and a half later, she's sending full body nudes, pornographic mm -hmm. nudes for $1,000 to traffickers for them to exploit her online everywhere. Then when she wants to get out, they use that as, as um, collateral, if right. you will, to expose her if she doesn't keep going or do more, right? Hey, let's see you and a boy together on mm -hmm. camera. I'll give you 2000 for that. Right. And that's how they do that. And so that's how ha that's how ha it's happening all over the place. Yeah. And so it's it's real dark work, but it's um, it can no longer be the white elephant in the room. It's become very, very prevalent. And I'm just thankful for, you know, that, it, that's one of the things we talked about. I don't I'm sorry to cut you no, off. But one of the things thankful. we talked about in the evening when we had Mary on, on stage at the church and we had three other professionals in the community who were sharing different things. And, and one of the uh, items that they shared, uh, things to look out for, of, of whether it's a child or teenager, even an adult who's being trafficked, is someone who starts out of nowhere showing up with nicer things, sure. starts st for, for no reason at all. So and, uh, and a caution for many is when you, you're talking about social media, uh, online things, I've even preached about this, you have to be so careful about the things that you share on these things. You yeah. mentioned the traffickers when they're looking for things. Uh, and uh, people who share their emotions constantly online, sure. people taking selfies and constantly sharing them online, mm -hmm. all of those things send messages. And you think only your friends are watching. But you, you mentioned something before in a positive way that somebody's always watching. Well, there can be a negative yeah, way, too. Sure. Someone's always watching, looking to exploit. Yeah, And it's always on a pastoral level, it's always concerning when you, you see people begin to share far too many personal things in yeah. that social media space that they may feel is harmless, but others can see it's a cry for something. Oh yeah. It's Absolutely. a cry out for a need to be met. And, mm -hmm. and somebody who is looking to exploit and harm sees that as an opportunity to do that. Yeah. So no, it, you gotta be right so on. careful with yes, those things. absolutely. I tell all, all the kids I come in contact with and, you know, we, we get to speak to a lot of them now because we're into a lot of schools. And, you know, one of the things we share and even Christina, who's a survivor, will share is that you can't undo a picture like a picture's out there. Once it's been captured, like it goes viral. Mm -hmm. I mean, somebody's always got it. And so that's one thing to understand is that things that are screenshot online are there forever, whether it's a conversation or, a, you know, whatever. And so you, you've got to be real. You just got to start in the home talking about boundaries around your social media platforms for sure. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things we try to do as a, as an organization is we, we want to educate our teenagers and got, and people, young people going to college, what to look for. Like you said, a great thing. If someone starts showing up with things that they've never had before, that's, that's something to maybe investigate. You know, if if um, you know people are having trouble at home, have a face to face conversation with it, or invite them out to talk to it, to talk to them face to face instead of texting it about it. Because a lot of times it'll be something as simple as, "Hey, my parents are splitting up." That is a golden opportunity. Mm. You know, when when a when a child doesn't have the covering of both parents, it's really really vulnerable. That child is vulnerable in a lot of ways they have no idea. About, mm -hmm. Right. And the parents don't understand that either. Right. So that's something to really educate people about. And I'm thankful that we get a chance to do that. Yeah. Well, in with a child, especially whenever uncertainty is enters their life, a child's first response, you fact kind of mentioned it with with what you went through. A child's first response is, what did I do? Oh, yeah. What? Yeah. I'm responsible. Yeah. And so that uncertainty, somebody can come along. Yeah. With an answer. Yeah. And that might not be the healthy answer. So true, Josh. And I'll tell you, one of the things I've experienced in my own story is, um, you know, 
one of the sharpest blades that the enemy has is the, that blade of shame, mm-hmm. right? Like shame prevents us from, like that's that was my story. My story was I'm scared to death. I'm ashamed of telling anybody about what's happened because I might have had something to do with it. I feel gross. It is gross. Nobody will understand. They won't want anything to do with me. They're going to throw their hands up and run the other direction as fast as they can if I let them know who I really am and what's really happened to me. Yeah. And that's the lie of the enemy, mm-hmm. right? Like that's the great lie. And so our job at NAHT is to penetrate that and say, that is a lie and you need to know it. And there are people who love you and will love you in your grief and in your trauma. And not only that, you can have freedom, you know, and redemption in your story. Yeah. And we, we have great curriculum around that. And, you know, that's one of the things that separates us. So at Bombay Teen Challenge, the international group that I worked with, there was not a, they're rescuing mostly uh, Hindu uh, women because that was their culture, Buddhists. Um, and so in their belief system, you know, they're, they have no worth, you know, at that point, they have no worth no matter what they do, mm-hmm. right? And so where I think that our organization shines is the alternative to that dark place is Jesus, Right, like that's the curriculum that takes people out of their their place and into a redemptive state. Yeah. Right, they didn't in the organization I worked with before that they, they couldn't communicate that as well, mm-hmm. and so that was big for what Mary's trying to do. That's awesome. And yeah. what what is the website for? Not we've talked about it before on, yeah. on Mary. And it's nahtcoalition.org. org. Right. Right. Dot org. Yeah. So please go and check yeah, out that website. You. And uh, and then also you mentioned a little bit earlier as we bring this to a close, you wrote a book and I, I wrote it. It's called Wherever I Wind Up. Yeah. And my quest for truth, authenticity and the perfect knuckleball. Yeah. And that's available everywhere books yeah. are sold. Yeah. Anything. And Amazon in particular, I think they've got some more copies. It's 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 I, I wrote it in 2000. And and this is a God thing, too, man. I wrote it in 2011 and it came out in my Cy Young year. <laughs> and so I had all the, like, I got to go on David Letterman and like promote the book. And mm-hmm. like people got to hear this story of God's redempti- redemption yeah. like, in the middle of maybe one of the darkest cities that there is in New York city. Right. Mm-hmm. Like people are super, they love their athletes there. And, and I was so thankful that I had a good run in 12 cause that's when the book came out. And you can't read that book and not be moved by the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's, I it's love got it. God all in it. Well, let me just tell you this. I, you know, you and I met for the first time today. You were gracious enough to come on this show. You never met me before. I mean, and, and it's so cool when I reached out and, and uh, you said, yeah, I'll, I'll come on. And I'm so thankful for you. And, and honestly, there are other athletes as well who are out there, whether retired or currently in it, and I'm a father of four as well. I got mm-hmm. two boys and two girls. And whenever I see athletes who are outspoken in a positive way, talking about their faith and they're serving the Lord and they're doing that, it, it just is awesome. I mean, and you have every reason. Your career is, you, you retire from baseball. Uh, you could be just playing golf. Or, I'm sure you'd do something <laughs> like that. But I mean, but here you are doing this and, and, and you're serving, you're on the board of of not with uh, this great team here. And I'm just telling you from someone from a, who watches maybe from a distance, how special and important that is to, to not only me, but to so many people. Well, so that's thank an you. encouragement, man. I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you. So uh, special thanks to R.A. Dickey for being on here uh, today. And I know this it was very helpful to a lot of people and uh, your story. So I want to encourage you go get his book wherever I wind up. And uh, if you ever see him speaking anywhere, go out there and and check him out as well. And then uh, go to not nahtcoalition.org if you want more information about that. So anyway, thank you. All right. This is Josh Heisman podcast, new episodes every Monday. You can subscribe, follow all that fun stuff and uh, look forward to having you here next week.